life, they say, does not give you what you deserve. Uh, life gives you what you have decided. And in looking deeper into that, from where we started as human beings, we will all have different stories at the beginning. And how we pursue that, it becomes very important what determines what we are going to be in the future. At the beginning, at some point in time, I thought I was going to be an electricity because I was putting light bulbs together in the house because we don't have electricity in the house. We use kerosene lamps and the rest. But at the end of the day, I think millions of youth also have access to mentors, especially today with social media time. People are sending good messages like what you guys uh, are doing in Generation Next. You have a lot of videos on, on the YouTube. These are mentoring platforms that nobody have to pay. In school, I was already teaching, I was hustling. I'm sure some people who don't have the hustle mindset probably are waiting for their parents to pay the next courses for them. If there is no course, they will sit down at home. So you see somebody on the street selling stuff, don't look down low on them because you never know how their life is going to be tomorrow. Who would have imagined that a group COO and CFO of three seaports with over a billion dollars of assets would emerge from the humble shores of Saruja village? Born to farmers, Ibrahim Asawane enrolled himself in school at the age of eight when he felt lonely at home. At some point, his family could not afford to pay for his education, which led to him dropping out of school. With the support of his father's cousins, he returned and completed. His quest for knowledge transformed him, taking him across continents from Lagos to Dubai. In this inspirational interview of a village boy's bet against poverty through education with commitment, consistency and a support network, the primer showcases the incredible potential to education as the best-selling author who is very passionate about personal development. Mr. Sawane, you know what is interesting is yesterday I dreamt of this, this setting. And uh, that is to say um, how much um, I am anticipating, or I was anticipating for this um, discussion. It's a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, my first question to you would be, how did your early life experience shape your aspiration and career choices? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sira, for the question. And I think that's a very important question, especially for our young people. Uh, life, they say, does not give you what you deserve. Uh, life gives you what you have decided. And in looking deeper into that, from where we started as human beings, we will all have different stories at the beginning. And how we pursue that it becomes very important what determines what we are going to be in the future. And in my own case, starting from a small village in Saruja, which was a, it's a farming community still now, but certain things are now available in farming, which you can generally put it as poverty. And if I put it this way, I would say it's more of a humbleness. That beginning, those challenges of, let's say, you don't have that electricity in the house, or those challenges of you walking to school for maybe about 30 minutes or one hour plus, they influence what I wanted to be. And at the beginning, at some point in time, I thought I was going to be an electrician because I was putting light bulbs together in the house because we don't have electricity in the house. We use kerosene lamps and the rest. So of course, life over time, you keep on changing. But in summary, it is those challenges or the social situation on the ground when I was young that sets a desire in me, which in my first book I describe as a burning desire for make things change. So up till today, they still stay with me because I believe there are thousands or if not millions of people in the same situation. And unless or until everybody have certain kind of social lifestyle, the basic lifestyle, I don't think any of us are free to call ourselves we are successful or we are rich as far as my own definition is concerned. Beautiful. That's a great one. Uh, great because as you are speaking, happily, I'm lucky to go through the book that you authored called Purposeful Education. And uh, what I find really um, stuck in for me would be um, you as a child. 
and uh, what I mean by you as a child is seeing your siblings, if you like, go to school and there you were uh, not actually going with them to school. That is to say you were not going to school. How, how would you take us in that regard when it comes to how education has played um, significantly in whom, whom you have become? Take us through, if you like, that, that, that scenario that I just started. Yeah, so it's, it's very interesting. So I think the truth is, I, I am not so at that time why I was going to school. Because I was with a friend, young colleagues at that young age, with my grandmother then, and every child in the company was going to school. So I feel lonely. And I, beyond being lonely, I know that time when the kids go to school, they, particularly on Friday, they come back with pancakes. Mm -hmm. They always talk about having a very good, nice food at the school. So that's why I say I'm so not so what, what <laughs> took me to school, whether it was the food or whether because I felt lonely. Mm -hmm. But I think one thing that came up over time as I go to school, we have a community near us, which uh, is called the Sapu Campus. And in that Sapu Campus, I saw there were very few people from my community who are working in that campus. So most of the people who are from my village working in Sapu, either they are night men, securities, either they are uh, laborers that are basically low, lowly paid, the officers who are in the nice cars, who are enjoying the ACs with electricity, are mostly, you may describe them, non native of Saruja and the surrounding. Mm. So I had that dream or hope that as I go to school, one day I can also work as an agricultural officer in Sabu. So this inspiration supported me further whilst I was going to school. And this is very important. Sabu uh, was a, a great agricultural center. Anybody who knows about the history of agriculture in the Gambia, mm. and you know the history of rice production in the Gambia from Jali and Pachar, was supported by the Sapu Research Project. So imagine seeing people growing in that situation, people coming with their qualification from around the world working there, and your community is not participating actively in that. So that has saved me a lot. And through that, I pursued the education. And from that time in primary school all the way to high school, I keep on pushing to have the knowledge then was to have a diploma in college because most of the people I knew was I have a diploma in the college agriculture. So I wanted to have the agricultural diploma so that I can come back and work in, in Sapo. But we, we thank God today we have achieved more and more growth beyond the agricultural diploma. Obviously, it's a manifestation today. But what interests me, you've mentioned you kept on pushing. Now, it may also interest us to know what were some of the push that you had to do? Take us through one or two things that you so, can remember. There are a lot of pushes. Uh, depending on what stage of life you, I, I want to pick it from. If I pick it from the social challenges point of view, mm -hmm. when I was going to school, as I mentioned earlier, my family is not as humble as you would call it. Let me call it was a low level income earning family from a farming background. Now, take it from a primary school level, when you are a child going to school, it is during the break time when people have their own small allowances, as we commonly call in Gambia, as their lunches. So most of your friends are buying food, whether it's fiscal, as we commonly call it. And sometimes you cannot afford it. Or in those days, we have a World Food Program where they supply food to the communities, especially in the provinces, for free. But what used to happen, you have to still pay some tokens, I think about 25 bututs uh, or 50 bututs, if I could recall the amount which they will use it as the fish money, if you may call it, since they supply most of the other food ingredients. But if you cannot afford to pay that 25 bucks, you won't go and eat with your friends on that day. So those social pressures are there. And then beyond that, you move from uh, a village, if I may call it a village secondary school, you move to a, a great school like Nusrat. So you will know Nusrat is one of the best schools in the country. So you get into a school where people are saying, oh, I'm coming from, is it Ndaos? I'm coming from LK. So those kind of names can sort of uh, challenge you. If you don't stand for, for yourself, you can feel a bit intimidated. And this was something during my, my first year or my first time in Nusrat I faced personally, where I remember uh, we were asked to introduce ourselves. Everybody was talking all the <laughs> fancy names. 
uh, as we described it. But someone like me talking about, oh, I'm coming from Brickhamaba, Junior yeah. Secondary School, and some people said, oh, which side is that? Yeah. In, in the Gambia, internet was not that uh, very well known and in those days compared to today. So you immediately feel intimidated. It's like I'm among the most brilliant of <laughs> Gambians, so maybe I should be uh, taking a last position in this class. But when I recall that situation, it made me determine that you are in a school which is very good. You have one of the best or the brilliant students with aggregate seven or eight or nine in this class. So you have to work hard to at least avoid taking last position. <laughs> So the, for me that time was to study very hard. Every day was like I'm having exam the following day. So I was studying very hard just to avoid the last position. And I don't know if they, uh, with the help of that study, of course, with the, with the, with the good teachers in Nusraj and the mentors at home, I was able to consistently maintain the first position in my class from grade 10 all the way to grade 12 in, in Nusraj. So I think sometimes social challenges are the windows to opportunities in the sense that they motivate you, inspire you to work very hard. So sometimes we need them in life, like we believe in, in, in the spirit of Islam. God brings certain things into our life to challenge us, but we have to work hard to be able to overcome those situations. Obviously, obviously. And uh, you know, what is interesting is like, as you're emphasizing that you felt um, sort of an outcast, if you like, because yeah. then you were intimidated in a sense that you are all the way from the village. So how, how was that experience? How, how best can you describe that experience? Because I'm imagining me being in a class in, in that regard, how intense I must have felt. How, no, it's, how, it's, how was it for you? No, it's, 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 it's really tough, honestly. It's really tough as a, as, as a person and as a teenager, especially if you look at because certain things as an adult today, you can sit back and accept certain things. But when you are a teenager, it's always very difficult among your friends where you feel, this is not the place I, I belong. So I remember my first year actually in Nusrat, every day when it's break, as soon as the bell rang, I will move and go to science classes. Because in the science, I had two, three other classmates from my previous school in the village. So basically you go and meet, you can call them the meeting of the village boys. <laughs> so we go and meet among, among ourselves. But I think, over time, I, I overcome that difficulty first year. Because when the first term results came, and I remember the announcement of the results was difficult because this class teacher came in, and then first time he said, oh, who is Mr. Uh, who is Ibrahim Sawane? Sawane? So I was not sure he was referring to me. In my class, we have two Ibrahim. One is Sawane, one is Sawane. So it's just the S and the U. So initially, I don't know whether it's a good news or a bad news. So I decided to keep quiet. I didn't say whether it's me or not. And I was sitting in the front. I always sit in the front, in, in the classroom. So I kept quiet. Then somebody said okay, to the teacher, can you repeat again? Is it Suwane or Sawane? He looked and he said Sawane. And this time around, he spelled it the right way. I said, it's me. So he didn't say anything. He said, okay, well done. Okay, he went back. So between the time he announced or asked my name and the time he was returning back to give us our results. It was an intense pressure because I was kind of thinking maybe I've, I've messed up something. Something has gone gone bad. But luckily, when he came back to the class to announce the results, he gave everybody their their results, and I was the last person to receive the results. Then he called me. He said, uh, "Grandma Sonne, come here." So I went in front. He said, "So all of you did very well. This is your first time results." But uh, Ibrahim here took the first in the class. Aww. So for me, it was, was like a big pressure coming down at that moment. Mm -hmm. Because it was not something I was expecting. In, in, a, in a mighty news that, if you will call it, to have a first position in the class among other students who are very good, uh, excellent aggregate from their, from their grade nine. Right. But one thing that was very clear for me, because I remember somebody said, oh, this is just the first time. Next time we're going to beat him. And I had that competitiveness inside me. I continue studying. And the more we continue, the more I was taking the force in the class, which also builds a more stronger relationship with other students. Because one thing I had to do is to, how do I work with other students? So by the time I moved to grade 11, with, with, the, with the other students, we move along. 
we started forming a study class. First, of course, it starts with the, with, the, with the female ladies because it's common that the ladies will come to you and ask for help. Then another uh, uh, guy or a boy will come to you and ask for help. So I had my study class with the, with the female colleagues in the class, the, the likes of uh, the the Drame, Mariama and the, and the rest. So we had the study classes. Then other boys also joined there and which I think was one of the greatest experiences I have in my life. Because by the time we moved into grade 12, we, we formed a strong bond among us, both boys and girls, with one common purpose of ensuring that we, we all succeed in our white exam. That is so, where, that's where you mentioned collaboration is better than competition. Competition. Because it could have been the other way around. Exactly. But what interests me, I'm going to cut you there, because uh, as you are narrating, because I read your book, yeah. right? And uh, I can actually see what you're saying. It's like a picture of it for me. <laughs> yeah. But my question, therefore, is coming from the village all the way to Nusrat, First of all, how were you able to make it to Nusra to begin with? Uh, what do I mean? Financially, it's important because uh, you've mentioned the financial um, constraint. So how did you climb all the way and get to Nusra? Take us so, through, rewind us a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So you know, there is this uh, a common saying, let me see if I'll get it right, but there is this common saying in the village. They said it takes a whole village to raise a child. And I think my education story also went through uh, a similar path. In during primary school, it was cheaper, or was even free. If I can, I'm trying to recall what was happening in terms of school fees. But one thing that was very clear in the junior secondary school, senior secondary school, we were paying uh, school fees. And I think it was around 150 dollars or 125 dollars, something like that. And at that point in time, this was difficult for my parents to be able to pay that amount. And in fact, I recall in my second year, in grade, which is grade eight, I had to drop out of school because that was the year my father had uh, eye surgery. So he was not working because he was a contract uh, laborer in Sapuden. So with those family challenges, me and my mom spoke. We decided that I have to drop and pursue another skill, which was to do carpentry. And I, I traveled to the to the city. I came to the city here with my 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 to meet my grandmother, who actually sent me to school at the beginning, who I was with in in Bakote. And after I came to Bakote, I was there for some time. Then one of my father's uncle came to visit him at the village. So I'm raising this because it took a lot of family members who came together to support me in pursuing my education. So when my father's uncle came to the village and asked of me, so we share the same name, because in the village, actually I'm called Kausu, not Ibrahima. So when the guy came and said, oh, where is my Toma? Uh, my father said, oh, he actually traveled to the city. He asked, why did he travel to the city? I had, he's doing very well in school. And that's when my father said, you know what? I understand because I cannot make all these ends me take care of the family, at the same time pay this school fee for him. So therefore he decided to go to the city and pursue a technical skill with then maybe a carpentry or mechanic as we, we call it here but then he sent uh, a message that I should come back because the amount for him was smaller then he should be able to pay that and that was how I returned back and enrolled into back into the into the junior school in grade eight I think I've, I've missed almost half of the time but uh, with the support of friends again and some of my relatives, I got notes, copied them, and then I continued with the class. So for me, that's why for everything I do in life, I try to look at the community. Because in my life, some people have supported me as simple as giving me an old notebook, which I read and I become better in the class. Some people have supported me as simple as buying me a shoe, which today, it may look smaller, but they all had impact because that one shoe make me to be able to go to school. Some people have paid some uh, school fees for me. And of course, after I finished uh, Brikamba, then which also have another interesting story. So in Brikamba, I think I had aggregate 27 or aggregate 28. I, I miss some of these numbers now as I'm growing older now maybe. <laughs> so, but I think it's 27 or aggregate 28. That aggregate could have been better. Because one thing I realized then, most students do arts and craft in their exams practical. So it has a belief that arts and craft is easier. You can easily get a two or a three. So on the other hand, I did woodwork. And the choice of doing woodwork was coming from two points of view. 
One is, can I have a backup plan? Assuming I could not go to high school, now I have a technical subject in woodwork, which I can become a carpenter and start making life better in a different way. But the second thing was, in woodwork then, the government was paying for the practicals you use. So they, they bought all the woods that you are going to use to construct. I remember, I think we did a tray. On the other hand, if you are doing arts and craft, those tie and dye, batik and all those things, they are expensive. The students have to go and buy. Your parents have to buy those things. So imagine someone who could not afford to pay uh, a school fee of 150. Imagine now spending 400, 500 to go and buy the clothes, the all the tie and dyes to design that. So I decided to say, you know what? Let me take my mind off getting those kind of things. So I think I, I got used to them at a very early age in terms of not comparing myself too much with, with other people. So those things, I learned them uh, over time. And those effects of not doing arts and craft, doing a woodwork, definitely does have impact on the, the final mark. But at the end of the day, it was good that I got uh, 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 the, the cut of mark. I was looking for the cut of mark to enter into Nusrat uh, in Commerce One of Nusrat. And that was 2001. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. You know what is interesting is, as you explain the story, now it's easier uh, when you're explaining the story. Unlike when it's um, something that you you lived yeah. when you lived yeah. on it before. And uh, I would like to believe this is the story of many many young Gambians, yeah. so many yeah. Gambians, if you like. And uh, it's nice of you that you had to pen it. Which is it's, beautiful. It's, 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 it's important for our society. There are lots of Gambians, thousands of Gambians who have stories uh, like mine, whose probably stories are probably coming from more difficult situations than my own. And I tell people we have to tell our stories. The stories may not be financial. Some people in life, they are the only child of their parents. So they are, they are lonely. They've never experienced the love of a sibling, a big brother or a big sister. So they have their own stories, how they challenge that. Some people in life, they haven't seen their parents. They were sort of brought up by their uncle, by their aunties. That's a different experience in life. So my belief is in life, all of us have different stories. We are all overcoming a different challenge. But one thing, whatever the challenge you may be overcoming, it's important you, you become purposeful about it. And that's why I, I titled the book as Purposeful Education. And for me, I purposefully educate myself as a way of fighting uh, poverty. I call it a bet because not everybody will have the same growth you have. But I don't know if day one thing is clear, in life, each one of us are betting against something every day. Sometimes we are not sure whether we'll succeed or not, but it's better we, we, we try it. They said you have missed an opportunity 100%, the one you have never tried. So if you want to start a business, if you never start one, you have missed that opportunity 100%. But if you start, you learn something from there. And I think that's what education and life growth is also about. You have to try something that you want to solve. Try to look for a solution towards it. And my own, as far as since when I was young, it's always been, how do I have a different life from uh, what my parents had gone through, from what I had gone through? How do I make a different life experience for, for my children? And these were the purpose that I've been carrying uh, throughout all my life and they still stay with me for anything I do. Beautiful. Um, that's really beautiful. But um, this would raise the question as to what did you do differently, if you like? I have a reason for asking yeah. this because uh, sharing your story, most people, if you like, would say luck has come in the picture. Right? Because reading your book, you taught yourself, self-taught. Yeah. Most of the degrees that you've acquired is self-taught. Yeah. Now, what would you say you did different that made you stand out, if you like? So, I think for me, it's the purpose of the purpose and the desire of the change. I want to make a change. And in pursuing that, I stay focused on what I believe will be the tools to bring that change. And that was education. And when I said I stayed focused, uh, for anyone who knows me during my time in Nusrat, when I finished class, I continued to study. I don't necessarily pack my back and go home because 
I was then looking at if I continue to maintain that good grade in Nusrat, maybe at the end of the day, I will get a scholarship to go to university. So since I was entering the school, I had a purpose of how do I pursue my education. And at the end of the day, when I finished my high school, I had a purpose and I had a determination to enroll in the university, which I got. A different story, I dropped out of the University of the Gambia. So which is a, a different social challenge we have as, as a nation where somebody with, uh, with uh, uh, five A's from Nusrat could not have a scholarship to study in the University of the Gambia. But this is a different challenge. But I never give up. Even with that five A's, I didn't have a scholarship to go into the University of the Gambia. I went back into teaching at Nusrat with the help of the likes of Mr. K. Mokai. He called me back to start becoming a teaching assistant in Nusrat. And whilst I was there, got my admission at the UTG. I even started some course with my friends. That was one thing, focus. So I was constantly focusing, read my notes, revise them. But for me, a focus needs to be backed by a determination to change something. Because if you don't have that desire, life, everything is simple for you. You think everything is fixed, and which I don't believe. There is nobody in life who can say everything is okay for me. You may be rich, but there are other things that are not there for you. It could be a relationship that you lack. You may have a good relationship. It may be you don't have a, you're not in the type of job you wanted. So that's why I said everybody has some kind of problems. Just that some people's problems are worse than the others, if you want to describe it in that way. So in my own, I wanted to make that changes. I wanted to ensure I have a good job. The job that can enable me to take care of my family. From my parents, my siblings, all the way down to my own uh, uh, nuclear family as well. So I continue to pursue education. And at the end of the day, you will see in the book, I said somewhere, personal development is a personal responsibility. And that's how I take education. I don't believe that somebody is there to educate me. Somebody is there to improve my career. I have to create those environments. I have to learn. And this is one thing sometimes that's missing for those who are into career. Because some people feel it is the HR that will and so I will grow. It is the CEO's responsibility. No, that's not for me throughout my life. Up till today, I sponsor myself on courses. Up till today. And I've started that since I left high school. When I got a job in Guarantee Trust Bank, the first thing I did was to go and enroll myself into to study a CAT. Of course, I was lucky to have mentors. Because all this is happening, there are people behind me who are giving me those good words, who are encouraging me, you need to go and study. But at the end of the day, I think millions of youth also have access to mentors, especially today with social media time. People are sending good messages, like what you guys uh, are doing in Generation Next. You have a lot of videos on, on the YouTube. These are mentoring platforms that nobody has to pay. If you decide to listen to it, you will get a lot of messages from all the speakers you have interviewed. This is free. If you follow those people's experience, you can also have your own way of hardware maneuver in life. So in my own case, I had access to people in the office, people outside the office who are talking to me, but I followed their advices. Enrolled myself into CAT program, studied it, finished it. Moved into ACCA program, studied it and finished it. It was after the ACCA, I was I had opportunity to get a job in Nigeria. But if I did not study, if I did not produce consistent performance at the work, I may not have that opportunity. Yes, we can say that is luck. We all uh, believe in luck. But the truth is, when uh, there is preparation, like, like a wise man say, if preparation meets with opportunities, there's opportunity here, but you are prepared. You can simply plug in and play. How can you get promoted if the next job comes, you don't have the right experience, you don't have the right qualifications? It's difficult. People can tell you you are lucky, which I never take it out. I'm a firm believer. But don't the day, there was hard work, which also went into each and everything that I've done in life to be able to make it through. And that hard work, I still maintain it in any job I am doing. That hard work is what I'm teaching my children to also pursue and follow. Because I told them it doesn't matter. And one of the people I wrote this book for is for my children. My daughter is the first person to, to, to read this book. I ensure that 
read the book so that you can know more about me to know that in order for us to continue a legacy it requires you to continue from wherever i will stop and this is what happens in the business world whether you are in the business or career if you don't build a family that can take over from you you can search around there are families who are businesses when the founder died the business also closed because sometimes the children did not check the same spirit of mentality the founder started that business. they're not involved they're not and the involved. same thing in career if you're in career you cannot just get the job and be comfortable and say okay i've made it i made you have to also tell your children to get involved in hard work to pursue whatever skills or whatever work they are doing let them get it with seriousness you want to be in sport let them pursue it but it's important you get that determination footballers don't just win a game they train hours just look at it in any sport thousands of hours goes into training so why am i as an individual i will say i have my degree program as you just sit and say oh i already have my degree as you sit down i have my acc qualification i have my master's degree but i've pursued many other personal development every year i must do one program and not just any program I must do one program that adds value to me as an individual so that i can participate more in the organization but also in the wider community because i believe i should be able to help the community i should be a change agent in my community that's my personal uh, challenge i take on now uh, as you are speaking you've mentioned hard work and uh when I came across your book and uh, you've mentioned a part where you had to sell after school you had to it's just so emotional as you're speaking how, how was that experience for you because you know I, I can imagine I can imagine me going to school after school holding a plate and selling and having your colleagues at work uh, sorry at school yeah. see you what was the impression like no, it is it's, it's tough. It's tough. As a as a young person. So one thing I do up till now, a uh, few days ago I came back from the provinces. So I saw two young girls in Garasoma selling. And and I, I reached out to them. I say, what are you selling? And I bought some stuff from them. Ice, those ice in the in the back. I took a picture of it and sent to my, my daughter. Most of this I try to teach my daughter she's my first child to know how life is uh, different and when I look at them it always reminds me of myself and I look at them as strong people because these kids are selling they've decided to leave or they have been forced sometimes they are, they are forced because even myself it's not like me like it so I try to sort of sympathize with them I don't only buy if I have the money at the price which is on their product I sometimes ask sometimes say this is for a lunch. I actually are you going to school? Yes. Okay, this is the price I'm paying for, but this one is extra for your lunch. I'm doing those things because it reflects on me and my childhood memories. Because like you rightly said in the book, you come from school, you you want to go and play. We are boys, you want to go and play football with other young boys. But you know your parents are also making a hustle. So my father has done multiple trades multiple trades you can uh, imagine but likely he sometimes go for fishing so when he got some fish he would say okay you have to go and sell that sometimes he will make uh, a local farm sometimes he will make a, a fishing net sometimes he will have some uh, uh, firewood logs then you have to go and sell that and as a young boy whatever age you are in we have this social pressure to get sort of approval from our friends and of course, you don't want those people to see you selling because they will tease you. They will, I remember, I'm, I'm so, up till now, there are some boys who will see me. They think it's going to make me angry. They will call me, oh, the, the, the son of a, uh, a fisherman, something like that, a big fisherman. So there are some boys who will still call me, so we just laugh over it. But in those days, if you tell me that it's fighting, so if, I, if it's somebody I can beat, I will just start fighting. The people I cannot beat, I just keep quiet and just walk away. Up, all the way to the school. People will tell you, oh, we saw you that day, you are selling something on the road. So you just don't want to, even if you see them during break, you know those that the boys want to go on the other way side. <laughs> so it was kind of, you may call it a, a, a childhood stress that uh, uh, I had faced, and which for anyone uh, listening to this program, especially for young people, 
when you see other young people on the street doing those tasks which look challenging, which sometimes may look like they are poor, because in all of this, the connotation is that they describe you like a poor person. We have to appreciate what they are doing. It is those things that give them skills. It is those things that they are doing that make them street smart. So at that time, I didn't like it. But today, I appreciate going through some of those challenges. I appreciate going through because they make me think different. They make me be a hustler. When I was moving to Nigeria, people were worried, can you survive in Nigeria? But I went down and settled in Nigeria like I was a Nigerian. I had the Lagos mindset. I'm, I'm never afraid. The life in Nigeria is different from Gambia. But part of it is because the hustles that I had gone through when I was young, they pretty much prepared me for what I was encountering in Nigeria. And of course, even when I came to, to the city here in, in Serakunda, I never had challenges. I never had challenges of getting uh, uh, sort of afraid to try new things. As soon as I finished school, I was already teaching, I was hustling. I'm sure some people who don't have the hustle mindset probably are waiting for their parents to pay the next courses for them. If there is no course, they will sit down at home. And through that, some people never go back to school. I know people who have that. So for me today, when I see a young person finish high school, you don't have the scholarship or the funding to pursue something else, I will tell you, look for something. Go to an NGO, whatever skills you've learned, support them in that. That will give you an experience of how office work. You finish university, you have no job, look for an NGO where you can work in. Try to be creative and do something else. But this is a skill which we have to learn and observe on the street. So you see somebody on the street selling stuff, don't look down low on them because you never know how their life is going to be tomorrow. So I think the best advice I ever received, I would say it came from two different people. So one is from my mom, but one also came from a mentor in my early careers in banking called Mohamed Gillen. And the common thing about them is building the relationship with people. So my mom would say in a, indirectly in a Mandinka proverb, saying that a, a rich man without a relationship is of no use. And I remember Gillen once also told me that in his office when we were in Gandhi Troll Bank, saying that if you have money, you don't have people, it's of no use. Because when you have the right relationships, you can get money. But if you don't have people as in a relationship, you can, you lack basically everything. We are social beings. We are social beings. Today, you make a friend, that friend may help you monetarily. But that friend may also help you in a time when you never expect it. So I think for me, the best advice I would tell anyone is to ensure you build the right relationship. And it's a very big uh, topic that you need to be looking at. It may look small, but building the relationships, whether you call it networking in the office, when you Looking for a job, we hear that, oh, this place you can't get a job is, is whom you know. That is a fact of the life. It is whom you know. In the corporate world, we call it networking. Okay. If you don't have the right relationships, you probably cannot even grow in your career. Because today, if somebody is looking for a banker, you work with Mohammed, you probably say, oh, I know Mohammed. Maybe three, four years ago, you don't know me you will not recommend my name. If somebody is asking for maybe an accountant, Mohammed knows me, he will say, oh, I know someone is an accountant. It's because he knows me. So we must build that, especially for young people. With this age of social media, we are always on the phone. We have to build the right relationships. It's very, very important. I would say the most influential person in my life is my, is my mom. Is, is my mom because I've, I've, I've heard a lot of stories about her from my grandmother, from my, my grandfather. So I'm, I'm very close to my mom. My dad is alive. I hope he will not be jealous here in this. <laughs> yeah. So, but the most important person is my, is my mom. So going through the, the, the traditional initiation as we, we, we do 
in the Mandinka or even I would say in the Gambian society where you do the circumcisions and the rest. So see, my grandmother once called me, say your mom went through a lot. She had to go and farm in order to prepare the clothes you are going to wear on the, on the final day of the initiation. Son, and my grandfather also told me, said, you know what? Because they have their own belief. In those days, when it's time to get uh, married, your husband is basically picked for you. Unlike today where I go and pick my, my, my wife and many of us has done it. On our own case, our father basically picked our husband for her because the father believed in it. And the father confided in me, he said, since that day onward, I always keep on praying for her Aww. because I basically force her to get into the marriage. So when I look at all those challenges and for being there for me, Again, there are a lot of stories that connect me to my, my mom. I, I used to get sick a lot when I was young. Almost every year I would, I would get sick. After the farming season, after the farm, would get sick. And she is always there. So being that first son. So I think with all those challenges she had, they also push me and, and influence me a lot. So anywhere I am in life, if, if I'm having some kind of enjoyment, I always thought about, okay, I hope my parents are with me here to enjoy this along. Because, of course, as a Muslim, uh, it has been said uh, in, in, the, in the hadith that our, our heavens lies under the feet of our moms. So all of these things make my mom very uh, impactful person in, in, in my life. It's, I'll make it uh, two or three. It's, after I am gone, that's what scares me the most. When I'm no more alive, because you don't know what's going to happen to you. The the, the people you love, that that depends on you. The people you are you are guiding. So I always sit and think about that a lot when you are not around. Because I've seen families fighting after the 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 father is gone or the mother is gone. But I think most of the time is the person who create that financial freedom in the family where people are on. When you're not around, people fight. Whether it's among your children, uh, whether it's among your family members and your children, that scares me the most. What's going to happen if, if I'm not uh, around and who will take care of my, my, my children? And this is something me and my wife always uh, debate about. I think we have common uh, fear there. Yeah. What happens to either of us? when you are not around. It's, it's a tough one, yeah. <laughs> it is. I think in my 18-year-old self, bringing it back to today, I would say, learn a few things about technology. Learn a few things about technology. And if, if I can change one thing in the education system in the country, mm -hmm. is to bring technology as early as primary school. Because the future is technology. We, we are preparing a lot of young people, which is a global problem. They may come and find that there is no job. AI is here. So for me, if there was a way, I would probably study technology, probably become a software engineer or, or, or something, which today I develop some programs here and there. But I think every young person, no matter the field, whether you are going to study a law, whether you are going to study marketing, you are going to be customer care, understand technology. Because when technology comes, instead of losing your job to technology, you collaborate with the machine, you work together. Early days in banking, people use calculators. Today there is no calculator, we use Excel. But it's only those who, can, who understand how the system works are able to have a good job, are able to grow in the system. Those who want to stay with the calculators definitely has to go out or they stay the same. So for me, technology, technology needs to be everybody's interest. If I'm, uh, if I'm an 18 year old person today. I would say when I got a job in banking, because all this other wilds 
they have given me a strong foundation of going to school, finish uh, Nusrat with a good result. But at a point in time when, like I said, you apply for university, you got admission, you have no scholarships. You apply for scholarships at the uh, education department, government department, you have no scholarship. You still felt life is sort of against you. Yeah. So at that point in time, I still felt that I'm still going through a lot of hardship. But it was that time when I got a job in a bank, I got my salary, I now know that I don't have to be worried about buying a bag of rice for the family because with this job, every month, they will have enough. Or they would afford this money, they don't have to worry anymore. I think that was a big turning point in my life, which I, I, I took advantage of as, as well by further pursuing education. I will still maintain the, the book that brought me to this public of speaking, that is Success Principle by Jack Canfield. Jack Canfield wrote a book about success principle, how to be successful in life. So basically contain everything you need to know about life. And I remember the first chapter about that book is about personal responsibility. So we have to understand that we are responsible for our life. When we are young, our parents take care of us. Now when we become 18, we are adults. We are voting. We are making decisions. At that point in time, we should not blame anyone in totality. We can always complain. We can always complain. But when I observe, for me, people have complaints. Yes, since the time we got independent up to now, people are complaining all over the world. But it has never changed things in a way. It's rather be part of a solution. And when you read Success Principle, it will tell you those things. You should try, if there's a problem in the society, how do I contribute? Don't wait 100% to be done by the, the, the government. 100% to be done by your parents. 100% to be done by your employer. You must have that 100% responsibility. In any crisis, somebody else is seeing it as an opportunity. In any crisis. But for that, you have to look at the crisis from a different point of view. Not from a complainer point of view. It's different from... Asking for a change is different from telling people to do something else. But just sitting on the benches and telling people, you must do this, you must do that, it will never work. Again, making reference to this, your program, you are creating awareness among youth. You could decide and sit and say, things are tough in this country. Our youths are traveling through back way. Inflation is very, you can decide and spend the whole day, talk about that in a WhatsApp group and chat. But your team have decided that to put a platform where you get people, interview them, and let the other Gambians and non-Gambians, because this is on YouTube, is all over the world, can listen to your program and learn from their experience. That is a responsibility. You have taken a responsibility. And in truth, when you look at leadership, they say leadership is not a title. Leadership is about the influence and the responsibility. So what you people are doing here, you are doing a leadership role. So whether somebody told you or not, there will be someone who is listening to your message and on that day, it changed his or her life or mindset about how to tackle or live his or her life. So I will encourage you to continue doing this platform. This is my belief. Even if you have one viewer, that one person's life will be changed by our message. And that's not a mindset of a complainer. It's a mindset of an innovator, a mindset of somebody who takes responsibility. How do I mark my own impact in the country, especially among our youths? So my top three, I would say, first, Jack Canfield success principle. Second, I would say uh, um, Roberto Kiyosaki's books on cash flow quadrant. That's talking about financial literacy, uh, which is a different conversation. A lot of people 
especially in our Gambia here, are not financially literate. People are making money, they spend 14, 15 years studying, yet they, one of the means of rewarding them is money. And they have no ways of managing that money. So sometimes it, it sort of surprises me. People have spent their entire life studying. They work from 6 o'clock to 6 o'clock. I use 6 or 6 because some people leave their house at 6 a.m. And they return back to house at 6 p.m. The monies they receive from there, they are not spending one hour in a day. How do I manage this money? So that's why I recommend to read books about Roberto Kiyosaki. He's one of the uh, authors in America. He writes about financial literacy. So all of us should be literate to understand how to manage our money, how to save, how to invest, how to even create extra income for yourselves. That's second book. The third book, I, I forget the name of this uh, lady from Stanford. It's about mindset. I think it's, I think it's Carol, Carol Dewey. It's about mindset. Because he said people have fixed mindset. If you have a, a, a fixed mindset, you believe my life is like this. I am, I am supposed to be poor throughout my life. Don't worry, that's how God put it for our family. That's how God put for us. I am supposed to be a genius staff in this company. That person has a fixed mindset. They never looks at opportunities. Where can I develop? So we need to have that open mindset. If you read the book about the research, this, this uh, I think it's a lady, I don't know uh, his or agenda, but this professor did from Stanford, it's a very good book about mindset. And of course, generally we have to read. There are a lot of materials out there, we have to read. You ask successful people in life, they are always reading. They are aware of what is happening in their environment. If we don't read, we will not know. There are millions of books, there are thousands of books, Gambian authors and non-Gambian authors. We have to read. Because when we read, we become aware. They said leaders are learners. You want to lead, you have to learn. And that includes reading. Know what is happening. Every book you read, you get something from there. So I subscribe to Kindle. Every week, I read one book. At least every week, some weeks, I maybe read two books. On different topics. Different, different topics. It could be on psychology. It could be on the business. It could be about history. But when you read these things, you learn something new. And if we don't read, it will be difficult for, for us to understand what is happening around us, for us to actively participate in the economy. You talk about new technologies coming, chat GPT. How many of us in the Gambia are reading about them? To know how, how can I utilize this to make myself efficient? He talks about new sectors or job profiles like ESG, which is environment, social, and governance. How many of us are reading about this? These are the features that are creating new, new jobs that are in our community. Few people are talking about them. And this will create new jobs. If we automate the role of uh, a call center, ESG is coming. How do you do social and social impact assessment of a new project? How do you look at the climate studies? How does it affect my job? If you don't read, you think you're just in marketing. You don't read about how do I market climate? Maybe your company can market climate. Maybe you have, but you have to read. It's when you read, you now know the use case of how does that apply to your company. That's why I like to read. That's why I like to go to seminars. That's why I like to take courses myself because they gave me a new perspective which I can apply to my job, which I can apply to the people I interact with, the people I mentors in my life. But if you don't read, you can't. Because you cannot give what you do not have. You cannot educate your children what you don't know. You cannot tell your staff what you don't know. You cannot tell your mentees what you don't know. So you must read because we are all leaders. Everybody is a leader. There is a boy in the village. There is another young boy below you who is looking up to you. You are a girl 
in a high school, there is somebody in primary school who is looking up to you. So we have to understand that we are all leaders. And we need to save the future of this country together. We have to do it together. I don't believe whether it's government or it's these people, we have to do it together. So the future is for all of us and our children. Now, the worst advice which I hear often we tell the young people, which is to be very careful because we don't complete it, is to follow your person. It's a, it's a very bad advice if you don't understand what it means. Because many young people will hear from inspirational speakers sometimes, or we hear from people who are more successful say, follow your person. But we have to be very, very careful. Follow your person has to have a context. When I was going to school, I wanted to be to study science, to study electrical engineering. If you read the book, I wanted to fix electricity in our house. If I had followed my person, I would say I wanted to go study science, but not commerce, it would become a problem. When I finished high school, I wanted to study economics and finance at the University of the Gambia because I love economics when I finish. But again, because there is no funding, I couldn't pursue that university. If I insisted that I must study economics, I didn't go and start that teaching at Nusrat. I may have not met Omar Jase, who would have introduced me to GT Bank to get a job in a banker, in a banking to become a banker. Wow. So when you say follow your person, I am not saying don't follow your person, but you have to know at what moment you have to follow your person. At the end of the day in life, when I look at it, I always tell my staff today, my person is not to be a banker or an accountant or to be a CFO. My true person is to create awareness, is to share knowledge. So, but I never stopped my bank job in order to teach in the school. I was teaching in the Gambia here at MDI at Nusrat whilst I was going to banking. So from Monday to Friday, I'm doing a banking job that gives me a reasonable pay. In the weekends, I go and teach. It was something for me, it was a person wow. to help young people to acquire knowledge. I moved to Nigeria. I started with blogging, writing. Still, I'm following my person of educating. So now I have a company with my friends. We do courses, we do teaching, but we never left our job. But in the long run, maybe we'll leave and start having our own companies that does education. So when we say follow a person, people have to be careful. It's not for everybody to just blindly follow a person. You can do it on the side and later when you are stable enough, you can think of pursuing that person. But don't just sit at home and say, this is my person. If I don't do that, it's a black and white or else I will not do something else. It's a big mistake which I will let anyone to, uh, know. Follow your person can be very dangerous. You must understand the context. The context. So that title would have been the title I would have given to this book, which I decided to remove, would be The Boy from the Village. Okay. That would, that would have been the original title for this one. Yeah. But because this book focuses more on my education, and that's why I put it on purposeful education. education. Because it has not covered uh, everything in my life. It's just purely my education and to some extent my work part. So there are stories of me not 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 in the book and maybe a story is like when I was in Nigeria when my landlord locked the compound and said I should not leave he wouldn't found those in the book we all have challenges the stories of when I was in Nigeria trying to operate uh, generators having fires in your house that's not that's not in these books wow. the stories of when you travel you got discriminated at the airport because you are the only black person in a flight where they say you park this side they're not in this book we all have stories so if I had to put those things here, the book would have been very long. True. So after talking to my editors, we decided to say, you know what, the, the story can be linked to education alone. Let's for the education part. Maybe you can write another book about your life, about traveling around the world. Maybe as a, as a black person in some of the Western countries where you felt, you know, you are basically discriminated. So, and which many people have uh, faced similar things. They are not here. So but I think generally my autobiography if I have my way will be the boy from the village because I, I I want to keep on reminding the 
young people in the rural communities understand that no matter where you come from, and which if you link it back to the president's book that was launched, I've not read it yet, yeah. but somebody told me it's a very good book, that he started from the village too. We all know uh, his own uh, story. Starting from the village, uh, as far as uh, Mankamang Punda, in fact, I'm, I would say I'm more closer to the city than the president. <laughs> so, but today he, he grew up and become a president of a country. So anyone can achieve anything. It does not matter where you are coming from. We all start from different places, but we can end at a different destination. Sure. And which reminds me of a, a friend's uh, message. When I was around, I, my, we got married. One of our friends used to tease him and say, why are you still not getting married? You are still not married. And he told me, can you look at the expressway from maybe from Taboko to going to Banjul? You see, there are small cars and the big cars. But sometimes small cars overtake the big cars. You see, that is how life is. Doesn't matter my age. Doesn't matter where you start from. We can all, we all have our own path to follow. So I think that's very, very important for us to understand. We don't have to be uh, competing with others because each and every one of us has been proven scientifically we are all unique. We are not mass production. Even twins, each of the twins are unique. Scientifically, thumbprints are different. They are not the same. So in the same way in life, you have your journey, I have my journey. And that makes your experience different from my experience. And that's how you see life. We are not competing with anyone. We are all trying to make our own change. Our part in this journey here, which is a short lived place, and when it's finished, we go back. My final thought is for all the Gambians and especially our young people. We are in a country which is largely youthful population. The, the world is changing. And as a nation, whether the young, the old, we have to think about how do we change this country for better? How do we develop this country? For those who have access to the power, those who have access to the money, let's look at inclusion. How do we bring those who are outside? Inclusive development is very, very important. The simple logic I always tell people is that when I am rich, I don't like to use those words, but when I am rich, the rest of my communities are poor. They all tend to hate you. They all tend to use you as their target. They all want to rob you. They all target you. And part of this is because there is no inclusive development. That's part of it. Crime rate and developments are linked together, and especially inclusive development. So we as a country, we as a community, we should look at development agendas, both private and government. How do we bring everybody on the table? Because one person or few people being rich is never going to solve the country's problem. We need everybody to at least be above the minimum international standard, standard of living level as defined by the UN and other bodies or the World Bank and the rest. That there's a minimum income everybody need to earn for you to be able to survive. So inclusive development is the future for any country. And I think more especially for Gambia, which has largely youthful population. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am really, like I said, fortunate that um, I've gotten this book, Purposeful Education. And as he likely mentioned, it's about his educational journey. And uh, you can get it on Amazon, right? Yeah, it's on Amazon. It's also at Timbuktu in Gambia here. Exactly, in yeah. Gambia here at Timbuktu. Another lucky me, I've got pass. And uh, this is talking about 12 proven secrets um, to pass any professional exam, which is a clear testimony, having taught himself and gotten a batching degrees uh, that you may have otherwise thought is impossible. So I encourage us to get a copy of this. Luckily, I've got mine <laughs> and I'll be passing professional exams. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sawane.
for this, so um, for this, for the fact that we kind of grab you before you head back. <laughs> Thank you so much once again. We appreciate it. The pleasure is mine. And uh, hope you would like continue to like if you like um, the, the 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 stories we bring to you. But it can only be more fruitful if you like our um, our 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 videos. You share our videos. So at least others who need this inspiration would also um, resonate with uh, the stories that we share on Generation Next. Mohamed, thank you always for uh, making sure that our audience, um, you know, get to be inspired every every single um, time that we upload a video. Thank you once again to you, our beautiful audience. Until we come your way again, it's a cheers from myself and uh, Mr. Sawane. Thank cheers. you, everyone. <laughs>